It's a real pleasure to be here with you guys. Um, thank you so much for the invitation to come. So I want to just break the ice a little bit. My training was in mathematics and physics. Okay? I'm into um, how we can use network science to explore systems across many, many different areas. And so I really embrace the idea of an interdisciplinary approach to network science. And so what that means is today here, I'm going to be introducing a few ideas that help us to tell stories using network science. And I'm going to gloss over some of the technical details, because I didn't quite know, you know the, the crowd that we are. That being said, I'm more than happy to discuss anything that I'm about to talk about at greater length. I just need you to ask me. So please, feel free to ask me whatever question comes to your mind. There's no stupid question at all. In fact, I really enjoy this when it's more of a dialogue than if it's just me up here talking to you guys, okay? So don't, don't feel ashamed. All right, that being said, I really want to start by doing an interactive exercise. So I want all of you guys to take out a pen and paper, and I want you to make a quick network visualization on your own. I want you to draw your friendship network, okay? Basically, the idea is to write your name down and the name of six to seven of your friends, maybe the ones that you saw this weekend when you were doing 17 different things. And then I want you to draw an edge between every two people who are friends. So it could be clearly your friends with everyone, so you probably have lines with everybody, but maybe your friends are friends with each other and so there's some lines. I want you to take a minute and visualize what that network looks like. How many of you guys drew an image that was kind of like this? You're in the middle, and each of your friends is around you in uh, what we, I would call a hub representation, okay? So in many ways, this is your ego network. You are the center of the universe. You are the center of all of these different friends. And so that appears here in your visualization. You are in the middle of your visualization. But this isn't the only way we could represent this exact same information. Another possibility is to draw everybody on the outside. What made you special? Why were you in the middle? This kind of signifies that everybody is here as a group, and we all play equal roles in our friendship. Another possible visualization is to put you at the head. This is a very strict hierarchical representation of what the network is. Suddenly I'm dominating over my friends in some particular way. I'm the most important thing, but in a way that's not just because I'm central. I'm controlling everybody. Again, we can see this from the network representation. Finally, you could think about it, well, maybe there's some other information which links everybody, such as the time order in which people became friends in this network, and so why was I representing it as a circle in the first place? Maybe what's really interesting to the study of this network is the order in which everybody began to become friends with each other. All of these four representations are of the same network, the same information but each one tells a different story. And so to me, what network visualization is, it's the process of telling a visual story. And so the real question is, what's the story that you want to tell? The uh, techniques I'm gonna show you, I've found to be very useful to help bring out certain attributes of stories. And I'm gonna give you a few guidelines on things that I think look good and don't look good. But all of these things are just guidelines. If you're actually going to be visualizing things, I guarantee you, you could find a good example out there where they broke every single rule that I said and it's still effective for the story that they wanted to tell. Okay, so please don't accept what I'm about to tell you as the rule of law. These are just fun ideas to help you tell different stories using your visualizations. Okay, that being said, I'd like to start with a really fun story. In this story, what we're gonna look at is called a patent network. And the idea is that if I am an author on a patent and I have a friend who's an author on the same patent, then I'm gonna draw a link between myself and my co-author. But I don't just write one patent. Maybe I'm going to write a whole slew of patents over the course of my career. 
And so this means that I'm going to become connected to many, many different other co-authors who on their own have their own careers and so they're going to be connected with each other. We can visualize this as a network. One company, we were able to scrape all of the different patents that they did. And if we drew that patent co-occurrence network, we get a visualization which looks something like this. Each node is an individual. The size of the node represents you know, how prolific they were, how many patents they had. And every single time they were a co-author with another individual, we drew our line. And what you can see is that here there's a very dense cluster of individuals in the middle who dominated most of the patenting of this company. They collaborated a little bit with people that were forced to the uh, outside, but not too much. However, there are little pockets on the exterior of individuals who were tightly knit and collaborated with each other, but not with that main core. We can contrast this with another prominent company where we also scraped all of the patents that that company did. Here we see a very different story. Here the, the network is more spread out. There was much more collaboration amongst the different individuals. And so what you get is instead of this hierarchical structure, you get a much more spread out visualization. All of these we can tell just from looking at the picture. Now, fun thing, you should know both of these companies. One of them is Apple and the other one is Google. So does anybody want to take a guess as to which one is here is Apple and which one is Google? Yeah. Exactly. Google is the one on the right, Apple is the one on the left. Apple has a much more centralized core of individuals who do most of their intellectual property. Whereas Google, they kind of distribute everything throughout the whole company. We can see that literally in this picture. So I'd like to leave you with this thought that a picture is worth a million data points. No matter how big your data is, no matter how complicated your model is, if you can visualize it effectively, then you can describe the story that's hidden underneath. Okay, so to kind of break up this lecture into some more manageable components, I wanna just remind you of two things which you should all know. Networks are made of nodes and they're made of edges. And so I'm gonna start with the first section of this talk, focusing on how we can modify visualizations of the nodes themselves in order to tell a story about those players. And then in the second part, we're gonna worry about what it means to have tons of edges in our graphs and how we can effectively visualize all of those interactions or maybe mitigate the effect of overcrowding of tons of edges, okay? So each of these things has their own story and the techniques I'm gonna tell you are gonna be broken down into these two rough sections. So let's start with the nodes. The most obvious thing about nodes is their placement on the screen. We saw that in the previous two examples, right? And a lot of what goes into visualizing a network is this idea that related nodes should be close together. You don't want related nodes that have certain properties that, that are, are, are co-occurring to be spread across your page. You want them to be clustered and to, to um, co-occur together. And so we could define this in many ways, but one of the basic ways that people use is to say, okay, my network structure determines what makes nodes similar or related to each other. Right? This is a very natural way of talking about it with some networks class. So here's an example network. Horrible layout. Nodes that are related to each other on opposite sides of the network. That doesn't tell me anything about the inherent structure of that network. And so what we're gonna do is introduce a method that's very common to visualizing networks, which is called the force-directed layout. So in a force-directed layout, what you're gonna do is you're gonna replace each of the edges in your network by a spring, okay? And now these springs can act and move the, no the nodes into a placement such that they make sense. Related nodes are, are next to each other. In other words, what's gonna happen is nodes that are far apart are gonna be pulled together by the forces of our spring. 
whereas nodes that are too close together might be pushed apart just a little bit more to give them a little space and avoid the overcrowding. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to identify the node locations that minimize the potential energy of the spring system. So if you're really interested in what that actually looks like, we can write down the potential energy of a spring system that's networked. And really all of this is saying is that we're going to sum over all pairs of our nodes. We give them a spring constant which tells us how strong that spring is, how close together the nodes really want to be or how far apart they're going to be pushed away from each other. And springs are quadratic in the placement of the nodes. So we have this squared term which occurs there. The L guy is telling me that there is an optimal length for my edges. So I don't want edges that are too small, so I miss the fact that there's actually an edge there, right? One of the problems is when your nodes are so close together, you can't even see that they were connected. So L gives me this idea that there's an ideal length that I want all of my edges to be. And I can optimize this quantity, and what you get coming out of that is a much more intelligible visualization of your network. Now you can see that there's actually a nice planar structure to my graph and certain nodes end up being core central hubs and those naturally move to the middle of my visualization. So things that I think about as being central and connecting everybody together now kind of uh, materialize in the middle of my visualization. All right, so how does that actually play out in practice? Well, I have a fun visualization. That I did recently. Let's see. You guys don't see it. Now you see it. Okay. This is, well, you don't actually need to know the story behind this particular network, but let's play a simulation of how that force directed minimization will actually play out. Initially, nodes are placed on the screen in a completely random fashion. And then we s slowly optimize that energy function, and the nodes begin to separate out and we identify some naturally co-occurring groups within this network. All based on this idea of a spring potential. And we can see that even more clearly, this is actually an interactive visualization. So I can pick a node here and drag it around. And if I pick the central node, yeah, I can kind of get all the other nodes to come with me, and then it bounces back into place. What's really cool about force-directed layouts, besides the fact that this is a lot of fun to play with and I have spent hours playing with these types of things to kind of rearrange this stuff, um, you can actually map this problem on to lots of other problems in network science. So how many of you have ever heard of like a community in a network, a community detection problem? Yeah, a few of you. So it turns out that uh, optimizing the force-directed layout is equivalent to optimizing modularity for a lot of these different functions. And so uh, naturally co-occurring co groups will cluster together in a really nice way. So you can map between these different problems. Um, the optimization problem here is pretty easy to solve for small graphs, but there's a lot of interesting research looking at how you would actually solve this problem when there's millions and millions and millions of nodes. And there's techniques that look at um, maybe a hierarchical level in my graph. So I can affix certain positions on far ends of the graph and slowly work my way down the graph, fixing smaller and smaller regions together. So there's a really rich area in optimization just asking the question, how do I arrange the nodes on a page so that it makes sense? Okay. Uh, and this was my video in case that web demonstration didn't work. So here's another fun network also rearranging itself according to a force directed layer. Okay. Um, but assuming that the network structure is the story that I wanted to tell is only one way to represent a network. Maybe my story is about a property of the nodes and I want to see how that relates to the network structure in some way. And so another thing you can do is talk about the uh, an embedding space of your nodes, maybe it's physical space. So, so I know you guys talk a lot about um, transportation networks in here and electrical networks in here. So in those types of systems, the nodes not only have a relationship with respect to each other in the network, 
They have a very physical relationship with respect to each other in a real space. And we can see how those two things contrast or work together by visualizing our network in the geometric physical space. So here's another fun story that I like to look at. Um, coloring here isn't quite as good on the black screen. But this is a transportation network for airlines. Each node is a major airport. And we draw a link between airports when there's a, a typical high volume carrier that flies between them. And what's fun about this is it naturally breaks up into regions that we would be able to distinguish in terms of countries in the world, right? So, uh, or in this case, continents. We have all of North America here in red. We have Europe showing up here in yellow. And that can be easily differentiated from Africa and the Middle East, for example, or Russia with Moscow as its major hub. So don't think that your visualization just has to be about the network and the relationship between the nodes as constrained by the network topology. Your visualization can also tell a story of some other hidden property to those nodes. For example, the physical location in a space. Any questions so far? You guys happy? Yeah. Is the color the only thing that is discriminate between the different of anything here? Um, so the color here is actually representing the latitude at which each of the nodes is, is currently existing. And you get a little bit weird stuff here. There's some green mixed in with Europe kind of because of that reason. Almost every single graph that we care about is non-planar, right? So I've, I'm actually going to have a slide on that in a little bit. But just to quickly review, a planar graph means that when I draw it on the screen, edges won't cross each other, right? Or there is a way that I could draw it such that edges won't cross each other. And almost all networks that we actually care about, the edges are going to have to cross. They're non-planar. That's a very rare structure in, in the space of all possible graphs that we could be visualizing. And so you're going to have to figure out nice ways to deal with that. Um, I love the question about the color, though, because my next topic is how do we talk about node color? And how do we use that effectively to tell a story in our network? So node color is typically used to represent two very different types of data. In one case, our data is sequential. There's a natural order to the values that I want to represent in a clear and concise way. Right? You can think about this as either being continuous numbers, or maybe they're discrete numbers, but they're clearly ordered. Right? They're clearly numbers. That's the important story. And in this particular case, you can use a color map that respects that ordering. More specifically, in, if you've ever heard, uh, heard of coloring theory, there's something called the lightness of the color, how much white versus how much dark there is in your color. And it turns out that humans are very good at perceiving that and associating that with sequential values. And so these are examples of sequential color maps. And you can see that all of them move through the lightness space, starting at very light colors and moving towards much darker colors. And that's done for a specific reason. There's, humans have a cognitive bias in which we think that dark colors represent more of something. So if you want to grab on and, and utilize our natural tendency to always associate light colors with less and dark colors with more, then you should not only use a sequential color map, but you should always orient your color map such that light is smaller. If you flip it around, you, of course, can visualize it that way, but humans will naturally think the other way. And it will take us a little bit longer to correct for your decision. In a general sequential color map, we start from small values and we move to large values. But maybe what's really interesting about our story is to talk about um, a particular value with respect to a reference point. In this case, we introduce what's called a diverging color map. And here, the idea is that we're, we have a reference value. Typically, you could think about it as 0. So maybe I'm, I'm visualizing positive values and negative values. Or maybe that reference point is the mean or median value of some particular thing. And I want to talk about how things differ or fluctuate from the mean. In either case, I'm going to take that particular value. And I'm always going to orient now two sequential color maps where lightness represents that particular value. And I grow darker as I increase away from that value above. And I go darker as I increase away from that value below. 
So one of the most common is to use something like this, where red represents a very negative value and blue represents a positive value. So these are when our values are continuous, but sometimes we have what's called categorical data. And in categorical data, there's not a natural ordering to my particular values, right? In fact, I don't want there to be any ordering associated with them. They're just names to particular things. And in this case, you actually have to be very careful and pick color maps that don't induce an ordering. So there's many great um, references available that will help you identify such color maps. But here the idea is that we don't vary lightness as much and we vary more the hue of our colors. And you can see that in all of these different cases, I can pretty easily distinguish the different categories, but there's not really a natural ordering from left to right of these colors. So this is particularly good if you have groups or community structures that you're trying to represent. You might use a categorical color map. And never, ever, ever use a rainbow color map. I can't tell you how bad they are. And the problem is that they're the default in almost ever, all visualization tools. If you use MATLAB or Matplotlib and Python or a lot of the R, for some reason they picked rainbow or they called it jet or something like that, right, as their default coloring scheme. It is one of the worst to actually represent either categorical or sequential data. And we could see this very easily by just switching this to grayscale. So if I were to move this to grayscale, you'll see that, OK, there's a, a positive and a negative in some respects, but there's multiple points in the middle that I would associate as that high point value. And so these types of rainbow uh, coloring schemes to the human eye suggest that there's multiple high points and I can't really distinguish the categorical values for these things, and it just looks like it's a mess. Moreover, another problem that you have to consider when visualizing a network is accessibility. Not all humans see colors the same way. In fact, it's been shown that, that women see a ton more color than men in general, on average, right? So if I'm colorblind, then this is the type of picture that I'm seeing versus this. So I can't even go off of the hue of the color to be able to identify the different values. And so a good quick way to check to make sure your visualization would be accessible to many different people is to just quickly throw your visualization into grayscale. If you go on any operating system through the accessibility link, there actually is an option to just grayscale your monitor. So you don't even have to do anything fancy in code or anything like that, both in Windows and in Mac and Linux too whatever it is that you're using. And I highly recommend that once you're done visualizing something, put it into grayscale to make sure that a lot of other people can visualize the same thing and understand the same thing that way. All right, to show you kind of how bad Rainbow is, here is a uh, power transportation network where I've colored the nodes based on a current flow centrality measure. If you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. All I want to ask you is, what's the largest value on that screen? Where does that thing exist? I'm looking at this and I don't even know where to begin. Maybe it's one of these things, they're really dark, so I'm instantly drawn to how dark this is. But that can't be where the values are because clearly the interesting fluctuations are kind of here in the middle. So maybe it's this yellow one, that one looks kind of high. I don't know, I can't really identify it. This is an instance where using rainbow was really, really the wrong thing. Instead, I could have picked a nice sequential color map that has a good natural ordering to the problem, and now suddenly that uh, high values pop out at me, right? Maybe I can't tell exactly which is the highest from here, but you can see that that one's pretty high, that one's pretty high. They're all really, you know, these, in that area. What's more, I really like this picture because it shows you that there's a nice central ring and there's a backbone to that ring, all with high centrality in terms of our uh, current flow measure. So if you want some resources to help you identify good coloring schemes to use, there's a few I've found to be really effective. One is called Color Brewer. This is really good. It was originally designed for cartographers, but networks are really maps in and of themselves too. And so there's a lot of really good coloring schemes here. 
that you can go to. Another one I like is called Coolers, which has uh, a few different coloring schemes that, that people have voted upon. And so you can actually get really good color schemes really quickly that people have rated as being pleasant to look at for some particular reason. And finally, another fun one is Color Hex, which gives you, uh, using particular algorithms in the space of, of different colors, it will randomly generate for you a coloring scheme. And you can lock particular colors in place that you like and randomize the other ones. It's kind of fun to play with, too. So you can all use these resources to find good coloring schemes for your particular problem. Okay. So we've talked about node placement, and we've talked about node color. But there's a few other properties of nodes that we can vary to tell a story. So another interesting one is node shape. And this can get very busy very quickly. So in general, I think that node shape is effective when we're only representing a few values, a few different shapes. Typically, node shape is used to represent categorical data. So again, this is a value where there's not a clear ordering to it but I want to distinguish between um, particular values. And so the story I'm going to tell with node shape is one of the disease zone. In the disease zone, the idea is that we have one type of node which represents human diseases. We have another type of node which represents genes that have been mutated and associated, directly associated with that gene. Uh, sorry, with that disease. So it's a story of these two different types of nodes. On the one hand, I have the diseases that afflict me. And on the other hand, I have the genes which might have caused that disease. And so one might want to ask, you know, are there similarities, say, between the diseases caused by the genes or vice versa? Well, in order to visualize that, I'm going to change my node shape and use circles to represent my diseases and rectangles or squares to represent my genes. And then I can visualize this network in different ways to tell me different stories about how these two things interact. So for example, I could project this network down onto the diseases. And I can talk about which diseases share mutations in certain genes. Likewise, I could project this network down onto the uh, genes and talk about how mutations in certain genes cause similar diseases. And if I want to combine all of this information together, I can still utilize that force-directed layout, but now I can still distinguish between my two different types of nodes because I've used two different node shapes. And so this is the great human disease ome, is what they call it. And you can really pull out that there's certain groups of diseases and genes which are related to certain classes of diseases that humans are afflicted with. And in particular, I find these types of connections really interesting. There are similar genes related to obesity and asthma. Or there are similar genes related to diabetes and hypertension. Maybe that one's not too surprising. But by exploring these different network topologies, I can learn more about how different diseases are related through the human body. OK, in all of these visualizations, I've also begun changing the sizes of my nodes. So let's just talk about that for a quick second. Node size is typically used to capture a sequential data. So there's a natural ordering to it. And almost always, if I don't tell you ahead of time, that piece of data is the degree of my node or the number of edges or links that that node is associated with. Since the degree permeates most of network science, and I don't uh, know exactly the types of problems that you're solving here, but almost all of them are probably related to the degree of the node in some particular way, we like to represent that in our pictures. It shows the richness of it, either when that's associated with the properties that we're interested in, or it's not associated, and it's interesting why isn't that associated with it. And there's a cute thing about node size that most people don't uh, grab on initially. So if I want to represent the numbers 3 and 1, so 3 is a lot bigger than 1, then I could actually use two different properties of my node to capture that value. I could use the radius of the node 
or I could use the area of the node. Now it turns out humans are biased towards more accurately assessing the area of an object than we are the width or the height of that object. And so to me at least, I don't know about you guys, this circle more naturally looks like three times larger than this one than up above. This circle looks actually a lot bigger than that one to me. And so again, if you want to leverage, effectively leverage the size of your nodes in your visualization, then you should focus on the area of that node representing the value that you're interested in, not the radius. And here's one of those other caveats. Clearly computer engineers designed most of our visualization tools because they default to radius, not to area. And so if you're actually just taking an off-the-shelf method, chances are you're actually going to have to transform your data in order for it to represent area. And as you all know from mathematics classes, you have to take the square root. So if you're just taking an off-the-shelf methodology, transform it, and you'll be then modifying your node area, uh, your node shape or size based on the area instead of the actual radius. All right, so here's our previous network where I've modified all the different nodes based on their degree. And now you can see an even more interesting picture pops out. It's not necessarily the case that the nodes with highest degree are central in this network. In fact, I think it's that node up there has the highest degree. And that actually has a low between this centrality or uh, current flow centrality compared to some of these ones more along the backbone here. So the next questions would be how could we leverage this now to talk about the resilience of this particular network to um, maybe edge, uh, uh, edge deletion, which would affect the hub more. Okay. Any questions so far? guys having fun? This is completely boring. I don't know. I'm getting like little half smiles. Okay. Let's jump to edge stories. So in order to do that, I want to introduce a new uh, network structure, which I also find to be really interesting. These are called food networks. And the idea here is that I've taken a whole bunch of different ingredients and I can group those ingredients in different ways, either based on the chemical composition of those ingredients. So certain chemicals occur in different ingredients, in which case I can draw an edge between my food and my chemical. Or I can group these ingredients based on what recipes they're commonly used in. So the more recipes which share two ingredients, the higher the um, edge weight I'll give connecting those two ingredients to each other. And then I'm going to project this down into the ingredient space. So all of my nodes are going to be possible ingredients. And I'm going to have edges between two nodes if they co-occur either in a recipe or they have similar chemical composition. And the weight of that edge captures how many times they've, how many different recipes they've co-occurred in, for example. Okay. And I'm going to represent this um, network using an adjacency matrix. Why did I do that? Well, it turns out that out of these ingredients that I've selected, they all co-occur with each other in at least one recipe. What that means is that this is an extremely dense network. Every possible edge that could be there is there. There's just give different weights associated with those different edges. But the question you might ask is, well, is there anything interesting to say about this network? And it might be very hard to see that from the beginning if you just visualize it, because every single possible edge is going to be there. You're going to get a giant big cluster. Right. So long story short, there is very interesting structure here. I'm not going to tell you right now exactly how I found this, because I think that's a topic of later talks. But this is an area called community detection in your networks. So basically, I've just rearranged that same adjacency matrix that you saw before. But now I've grouped things that are highly related together. And what you see is a pretty natural structure which occurs. But this still doesn't help me, because every single edge is still there. 
right? And so if I were to actually try to visualize and draw this network as a network diagram that you would be commonly associating with networks, I would see still every single edge floating around. And I wouldn't really see the true structure. So one might ask, are there techniques to kind of simplify the edges in a particular network and throw away ones which aren't that important to the structural story that we want to tell, but keep the core set of edges that will describe and capture our story? And of course, if I'm setting it up this way, the answer is yes. There's a few different ways. So one of the most common is to just use a maximum spanning tree method. I think I saw in a previous presentation, you guys did minimum spanning trees, right, on a graph. So does anybody know how to take all of the different algorithms which are available for minimum spanning trees and solve the problem of finding a maximum spanning tree in your graph? Convex optimization 101. Exactly. Negate all of the edge weights, and suddenly finding the minimum becomes finding the maximum of my problem. So you already have the tools and machinery in order to find maximum spanning trees once you've learned how to find minimum spanning trees. OK, so I found my maximum spanning tree in the graph. You know what? This is, looks like it did a pretty good job. It's kind of captured a bunch of those blocks that I saw occurring beforehand. But now I've also, I have almost went too far. I got rid of almost every single edge in my network. Maybe I threw away too much. So another possible option, well, you said that there were edge weights. Why don't I just throw away the smallest of the possible edge weights? This is known as thresholding my network. Here I say there's going to be some minimum value, and any edge that has a weight under that minimum value, I'm just going to get rid of. Well, that also sounded like a sensical way of going about finding structure in my dense network. But the problem is that a lot of edge weights occur over a broad spectrum of different values. And different values of edge weight mean different things to different nodes. So maybe I had an ingredient that actually was pretty rare versus an ingredient which occurs a ton with everybody. And by thresholding, I've gotten rid of all the links now to my rare ingredient, and I've kept every single link in my uh, common ingredient. So that really actually wasn't a good way of finding a hidden structure in my network. And what I've done here is I actually picked a value. I picked the largest value such that I kept my graph uh, connected. If I had picked any value larger than this, I would have um, ended up breaking my graph apart into a bunch of disjoint components. And you know what? That really didn't do too much in terms of helping me identify um, the coherent structure there while removing useless edges. In fact, here I've kept way too many edges. So my favorite technique that's available to solve this problem is called the multi-scale backbone. It was developed um, just under, uh, what is it, nine years ago now. And in the multi-scale backbone, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, OK, this problem is actually relevant for every particular node, but I should consider each node independently from each other. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at all of the edges which are co-occurrent to a node, and I'm going to look at the distribution of the edges, weights there. And then for each node, I'm going to make a decision, was this edge important for this node or not? The mathematics of that works out. It's actually using rank order statistics. So the idea here is that if I uh, were to put all of my edges, uh, edge weights down on a line, I ask how densely populated is that line. If all of the edges are, are clustered together and there's one edge which dominates, then clearly that edge was really important. But if all of the edges kind of equally populate my line, then everybody was about equally important. And so there isn't a clear um, backboning edge that dominates my system. And you can then make this a decision problem for every particular node. So we have some thresholding alpha, which is kind of like a p-value now. So again, it, you still have to pick this alpha. But it's an actual significance of my edge, not just a value that's kind of uh, describing the weight of my edges. And this allows you to make a decision, OK, for every single um, 
node now, I'm going to look at the distribution of edge weights, and I'm only going to pick those edge weights which are most significant to describing the structure. And if I do that, again, I'm going to use the rule that I'm going to pick an alpha. The, um, in this case, it's the smallest alpha because it's kind of acts as a p-value, such that I keep my graph strongly connected. And what pops out are clearly those group structures that I was really interested in beforehand. But now I've gotten rid of a whole ton of the data that didn't really help understanding these particular structures. So this is something now I can visualize in a traditional network way. And they can go and do that. And what you get is something that looks like this. So each node, again, is an ingredient. And edges now are the important co-occurrences of that ingredient with another ingredient in a recipe for this particular case. And you get really fun clusters of different things that make sense together. So all the cheeses are kind of down here. You can kind of interchange cheeses or mix cheeses together in recipes. Uh, what are other fun fruits? Kind of pop out naturally here. We have the fishes, the fish group down here. And some other fun, really interesting structures. Turns out garlic co-occurs with a lot of different things, but not very many things significantly. So garlic is that like use all, catch all ingredient that everybody throws in, but it doesn't have any naturally co-occurring objects that it really works well with. The exception being, I think, leeks. Yeah, leeks and onions. It enhances the flavors of leeks and onions in really cool ways. It also should match with steak, I think if we follow one of those lines appropriately. OK, so let's combine some of these ideas to talk about other stories that we could look in our networks. Another fun thing to study is hi hierarchy. Hierarchy is this idea that some things are just more important than others. right? They either control something or there's a directed flow out of them to something else, kind of in a downward dendrogram, acyclic graph way. And our question could be, could we easily and naturally represent our network using a hierarchical representation? So a very interesting new technique that's just been developed to do this is called spring rank. And the idea is that we're going to again embed our nodes into a certain space, except this time we're going to go into a one-dimensional space. And I'm going to use kind of physically unrealistic springs in that they only push, they don't pull. Mathematically speaking, I can do that. Physically speaking, it doesn't really make sense. But the idea is now I have this one-dimensional space. And where the nodes fall on that one-dimensional space reflects their hierarchical importance in my network. Really important nodes, which dominate over a lot of other nodes, are going to be pushed high. Whereas nodes that are not that important are going to end up low in my hierarchy. So this is equivalent to maximizing top to bottom links in my structure and minimizing bottom to top links. OK? Again, if you're really interested in the details, we could write down the Hamiltonian for the spring system. And you can end up solving it. Um, the difference here is that we actually have to specify a particular value. And this is because there is no reference value for my ordering. So you have to kind of say, OK, I'm either going to fix the smallest value in my uh, space, or I want everything kind of centered around 0. But you can kind of, um, there's a few different tricks to get around this here. But if you were to solve this directly, it'd be a singular matrix, right, for linear algebra buffs. Point is, once I make those decisions, then I can naturally embed my network into this one-dimensional space. And what I get out of that is a hierarchical representation of this network. So this is a network that just recently uh, was published that I like the story about a lot. This is the faculty hiring network for computer science faculty. Each node here is a different school. And links say, I got my PhD at one school, and then I was hired by another school to become a faculty member at that school. And what do you see that should pop out at you? Well, in red, I've drawn all of the links that say I got my PhD at one of these schools and I got a faculty position at a higher school in the hierarchy. 
And in blue, we drew all of the links that said, I got my PhD at a high school, and I ended up teaching at a lower school in this hierarchy. This is the all boys club of computer science. You have to be from Stanford to teach at Stanford. The top one is Stanford computer science. They almost never hire from anybody else. Have to be careful. Not almost never. There is some equality. I'm being recorded. They're a very good department. <laughs> but there's some um, systemic inequality here that we can easily see by visualizing and capturing the system using a hierarchical representation. Yeah? So will there be any uh, edge between and those, I mean, self loop kind of a thing if they have got a PhD? Yeah, so I'm actually not showing the self loops, but there's, they're completely allowed in the system. The only thing is that they don't affect where you are placed, right? So from myself to myself doesn't actually affect my hierarchical relevance or ranking with respect to other things. Yeah. And again, I've, I've visualized the uh, size of the node to capture the number of faculty that are being produced or the number of PhDs that are being produced. So it's also the case that there are larger Systems, those are the more prestigious ones in terms of this ranking, All right? So there, is, there are other factors that are occurring. But it turns out not only are they larger, they, they uh, mostly send links out. They don't take as many links in. Any other questions? Okay, so let's talk about one more story, which I think is really cool. It's currently develop, being developed in the lab that I'm working at by a few of my collaborators. And this is, uh, before I, I introduce that, I wanted to just quickly review a planar graph, but we already kind of did that, so that, was, that did some extra work for me. Right? Recall that a planar graph says that I can draw this in a two-dimensional space such that my edges will never cross each other. But it turns out that most networks we actually care about are non-planar. No matter how I arrange them on a page, I will always have edges that cross. Well, this is very physically unrealistic if you think about it. Edges exist in a space, and there's no way for two edges to instantaneously cross each other, really, without there being some sort of overlapping mechanism. Right? If we're talking especially like uh, electrical power grids or something like that, the edges are actually power lines that are existing in our world, and there's no way for them to just magically pass through each other in some way. And so it turns out that while most graphs are not planar in two dimensions, in three dimensions, every graph can be represented without any crossing edges. And so what do I mean by that? Well, here's a graph that I've laid out in three dimensions. And what's actually happened is, if I were to just use the naive approach of force-directed kind of lay out this graph, I get a crossing right in the middle. So this is physically unrealistic. But what I can do is add a force in a different direction. So now I add kind of a, uh, you, you could imagine now my links, instead of just being lines, they're actually tubes. They're rubber tubes. And they have some sort of give and bend to them. I can stretch them how I want, but they have a natural length and shape that they um, prefer. And what that does is it allows me to talk about how the edges bend around each other. And if I use this model, it actually adds just an extra term to my traditional force directed, but now in three dimensions. I can lay out any graph I want in three dimensions such that the edges will never cross. This is currently work in submission, so don't go spreading all this around. But my colleagues are really interested in it. This is really cool and has some important consequences. Um, first of all, it has important consequences for the structural integrity of my network. So if I want to think about, for example, how the brain contains tons and tons of neurons, and each one of those neurons has axons that are running around, so those are my edges, the neurons are my nodes, and I want to know, is that brain structurally sound, or do I have to support it? Is it going to be really fragile? It turns out that the brain is in a regime where the edge size is large enough that it can hold its shape on its own. I don't need a special skeleton inside of my head to hold the, the brain up. And that's purely because of the network topology and using a 3D layout. 
On the other hand, there are other networks which are much more fragile, where if I were to put them in a three-dimensional space, they couldn't hold their structural integrity. And I also really like finding those networks that are balancing somewhere precipitously in between. So this is a really cool 3D network that we uh, actually got 3D printed, where uh, this is that same food network that we were looking at before. But now we've laid it out in a three-dimensional space, and we made sure that none of the edges will ever cross each other. Move just a little quickly, but that's OK. I used these resources to make a lot of the visualizations that you saw. So I'm a big Python guy. I really like using the Python libraries, and because, mostly because all of them are open source. And so uh, GraphViz and GraphTool are both cool Python add-ons that you can use. And then D3 is the uh, data-driven documents technique that I use to visualize that um, network in the web page that we could actually interact with. OK, that's all I have for you for today. We'll end, I guess, a little bit early, unless you want to uh, kill the empty air. Um, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have, or if you want to dive into some of these to topics in a little bit more detail, I'm very happy to do that.